Good afternoon. I'd like to start by asking a question of you that you can silently answer. And that is, how many of you have seen these plants? Rattlesnake master with the round flower head and the yucca-like foliage, queen of the prairie, marsh blazing star, purple milkweed, um, prairie smoke, flowers in April, it has this fluffy seed heads in May, bottle gentian, hairy beard tongue, funny names for some of these plants, prairie dock with its nine foot stalk of flowers that will enable it to attract pollinators, and then cup plant that will hold water for days, allowing insects and birds to come get a drink of water between rain events. And there is a native orchid, and there is um, a flower that, will, that is sticky so that bugs will come land on it, get stuck, and that becomes a bird's lunch buffet. And these are all Midwestern native plants. And we all live in the Midwest, and I'll bet you most of us have never seen many of these plants. So why is this important? Well, how many of you like birds, all right? Okay. Well, birds need a lot of insects to feed their young. Um, in fact, 96% of them feed their young insects in the spring. And that chickadee, for example, pictured there, needs between 350 and 570 caterpillars each and every day for 16 days that they raise their clutch. Do the math, that's between six and 9,000 caterpillars that it needs to feed its young. And they need to get all those caterpillars within a 50 yard radius. And that's just one chickadee nest. So now think two chickadee nests, cardinal, wren, and you need a lot of caterpillars to feed those. In addition, fish eat insects, amphibians eat insects, and even 23% of the diet of black bears are insects. And here's the catch. 90% of the insects that are feeding these animals are specialists and can only eat native plants. And the reason they can do that is because they co-evolved with them. All plants have chemical defenses that prevent all these insects from eating them. How many people here would grab an onion and just bite into it? There's usually one in the crowd. <laughs> um, but God did not put an onion on this planet for us to cut up and put into frying pans. What an onion does to your sinuses is a chemical defense that it has evolved to deter things from eating it. Same thing with lemons, mints. And most plants taste terrible. So, so our native insects have had enough time to overcome those chemical defenses and be able to eat them. But introduce a non-native plant with different chemical defenses than it's ever before encountered, and an insect cannot eat it. So we all know about the monarch and how the monarch caterpillar can only eat milkweeds. No milkweeds means no monarchs, pictured on the right there. There is a spice bush swallowtail caterpillar on the left only eats the leaves of spice bush. And there's the adult. So you look at this oak tree here and you go, what a nice, beautiful, lush tree. And you get up close and you find it's being chomped. And this is good news because it is feeding wildlife. And so native plants will support lots and lots of insects. So columbine will support 18 species of insects Asters, 105, and oaks are the winner at more than three, 500 species of insects that they will support. On the other hand, native, um, non-native plants supports very few insects. Norway maple, which is an invasive species, only supports seven species of insects. Boxwoods, only one. Forsythia, one. And butterfly bush, my favorite, least favorite plant will support zero. This plant is sold by big horticulture because it's supposedly great for butterflies. But it's from China, and it has chemical defenses that allow for exactly zero species of caterpillars to eat it. So it begs the question, why feed the adults when you're starving the kids? Imagine sitting at the dinner table, 
with your kids or your grandkids, pulling up the dinner platter, shoveling some food onto it, onto your plate, and turning to the kids and saying, sorry, you can't eat. And that's butterfly bush. And it is now on invasive species lists. So the weather's gonna be great tomorrow. Go home and kill your butterfly bush. <laughs> so the bottom line is that native plants produce way more insect biomass, 3,500% more caterpillar biomass to feed birds. And if that weren't enough, bees are picky eaters as well. Our native bees are four times more likely to take nectar from native plants than non-native plants. Makes sense, they co-evolved. And 20% of our 400 species of bees that are native here in Michigan, 20% of them rely on one or just two kinds of flowers to get their nectar. So if they, those flowers don't exist, neither will those bees. So we use native plants because of habitat. Plants at the bottom of the food chain, the only thing that can convert the energy of the sun into biomass, which feeds those insects, those 90% of the insects that can only eat native plants, and the 96% of birds that need insects to eat, and amphibians, and the things that eat the things that eat the insects. So that great blue heron may not eat insects, but it is critically dependent on insects for the food. That its, that its food needs. So if you have landscapes without native plants, you're gonna have no insects, no birds, no amphibians, and that cascades up the food chain. So in, the, in our landscapes, native plants are, are adapted to the inevitable sub-zero temperatures we get here and the inevitable heat and drought we get in the summer. And they can do that all without ever being watered, fertilized, or sprayed. Because think of it this way, before European settlement, who watered, fertilized, and sprayed these things? So you look at this butterfly weed there, and you look at the crappy soil that it's in, and this plant is very, very happy there. And how is it? Because it has a 15-foot deep root system, despite only being 18 inches tall. And like most native plants, they have very deep root systems. By way of reference, here is turf grass with its four inch deep root system. So many of these native plants have root systems that are five, seven, 10, even 15 feet deep. So when it's dry out, they don't even know it's dry because they're sucking on water from deep within the ground. So the little photoshopping, there's Indian grass. This is ground level. This plant has more biomass below the ground than above the ground. So the advantages of using native plants is increased habitat up the food chain, um, fewer resource inputs. You don't have to water these things, so that reduces your water bill. You have no chemicals, and that makes for a safer landscape for you, your pets, your kids, your grandkids, and for wildlife. So here's what we're up against. We're up against conventional landscaping practices taught to us by big horticulture. And they will only talk about the beauty of their plants. And their plants are beautiful, but they won't talk about the function. And the reason they won't talk about the function is because they can't. Because their plants are mostly from other continents that have chemical defenses that our insects cannot eat. So here's a typical landscape. You may recognize all those plants. To an insect, this is a desert. There is nothing to eat there. Here um, in a suburb is the intersection of, of Overlook Trail and Acorn Trail. There is not a tree there that produces an acorn. And the Overlook is into a mode detention basin. One day I'm driving around and I go, oh look, wild oak meadows. So I go in and it is neither. Look at the names of new subdivisions that are being built. They're all named after what they destroyed. And so I think these developers have probably hired George Orwell and Associates to help them come up with names for their subdivisions. So we're gobbling up the land, and you can see that on a nighttime satellite photo. In fact, between 95 and 97% of the original US land mass has been cut, plowed, or paved. 40% in agriculture, more than 50% in city and suburb, 
And in that, we put a lot of lawn, increasing it every day with a lot of chemicals and a lot of water. And so our parks and natural areas are no longer large enough to support biodiversity. One third of our birds in Michigan are in trouble. Invasive species are a big problem. And big horticulture continues to sell plants from other continents, some of which are invasive. So we have landscapes without nature. We've been taught, to, to, um, we've been taught that the only good insect is a dead insect. But when we do find them, we're taught to, sp to kill them, um, get plants for that, are, that are pest free. And so we have landscapes with few insects. So here's what you can do. You can build prairie. Um, we've all seen this guy, right? Maybe it's you. But it begs the question, why do that when you can have this? Um, but you could do it in smaller areas, too. This is the Kresge Foundation in Troy. They're back 40, all, all native. And there's my backyard. You could also build formal perennial beds <clears throat> with native plants. That's my front yard in June, my backyard in June, my front yard in July, my backyard in July, my side yard in August, my backyard, and you can see a little pond there, in August. And that's my front yard rain garden that's collecting water off the roof and infiltrating it into the ground before it goes to the stormwater system. <clears throat> And there's the Kresge Foundation. Look at the diversity in plants and the leaf texture and the color. Beautiful and functional. You could also build informal wildlife plantings. <clears throat> if you can do this in Bloomfield Hills, you can do it anywhere. Um, down to the pond. <clears throat> Here are pictures for, of so I landscape my house mostly with native plants. Here are pictures of wildlife that I attract. There are the inevitable oleander aphids on swamp milkweed. This is the time to practice your meditative breathing because wait for the lady beetle, beetles. If you spray this, you're going to kill those lady beetles as well. There's a bee on mountain mint and on wild, ber wild bergamot and swamp milkweed and echinacea. This is this is bottle gentian. It is a closed flower that only our native bumblebees are strong enough to open. And it blooms in September. Now, this is going on in my front yard at home right now. <clears throat> Bottle gentian, botanical names gentiana and druzy. Gulp. How cool is that, huh? Um, I'm raising um, damselflies, and there is black swallowtail, and monarchs, and other butterflies, and I have hummingbirds, and morning doves. Even had a great blue heron show up. <clears throat> Robin taking a bath. Even have ducks show up from time to time. There's a robin eating berries from red twig dogwood. One day I'm sitting in my office and I hear a splash. And I look out the window and I see a bird fly out from underneath the water in my pond. This is a female belted kingfisher with one of my goldfish. <laughs> <clears throat> so one. I'm there when it happens. Two, my camera's sitting right next to me. Three, the batteries aren't dead. <laughs> and four, it posed. So that's pretty cool. This is my winter bird feeder. I leave things up, let the seeds drop. I'll have 100 birds out there in the winter. Don't need to go run to the store and buy bird f a bird feeder and bird seed. It's right there. And this opossum showed up. Now, I know a lot of you have a negative reaction to a possum, but understand these three things about opossums. One, they're the only North American marsupial. Two, they are tick magnets. So in that regard, they're beneficial to human health. And three, they're cuter than hell. <laughs> so what's he, what eats songbirds? 
Cooper's hawks. I regularly have Cooper's hawks patrolling my yard, and I've seen them grab birds and eat them. I also have coyotes, middle of the day. So how, how can you start? Well, you could start by ripping everything out and going all native, and you can do that, but it's time consuming and expensive. You could take out a little lawn every year and plant a perennial bed or a rain garden. You could flip a perennial bed, or whenever a plant dies, replace it with a native plant, and you'll be moving forward. So I like to live my life in a way where I leave, it a little, leave the world a little bit better than when I found it. And one of the ways I do that personally and professionally is by utilizing native plants in my yard and, and, and in my work and building that food chain. It's a little bit that I can do, and it's something we can all do, one plant at a time. Thank you.